How are we doing this morning? Good. If you got your Bibles, go ahead and grab them. Be in First Thessalonians chapter five. First Thessalonians chapter five. Today we're going to look at our next big word, which is sanctification. <clears throat> First Thessalonians 5, we'll get there in just a moment. You, you keep turning, you keep searching. When the United States entered World War II, the automobile plants were changed from peacetime production to wartime production. Instead of making cars, they began to make tanks and planes. The entire purpose for why they existed changed. I hold that thought. So we spent the last five weeks actually pretty much on salvation. Now, we looked at a whole lot of stuff that, that goes into salvation, like the great exchange and, and all that kind of stuff and, and reconciliation and all them other big words. But they were all for salvation. But now that salvation has actually happened in your life, now, now we got to look at what happens after salvation. So, so salvation has happened. The question now is, now what? Now what do I do? Now that I'm saved, what do I do? So what happens after I give my life to Jesus? So now today we're going to get this thing called sanctification. And I'm just going to go on and let you know ahead of time. Next week it's going to get very uncomfortable in here. <clears throat> but first we've got to get your, your sanctification lined up. The purpose of your existence has changed. Did you get that? You are now, if you're saved, if, if you say, yeah man, I, I, I believe Jesus, I've confessed Him as my Savior. You are now no longer to serve sin. You now serve Christ through how you live your life. So 1 Thessalonians 5, if you're there, say, I got it. Go toward the end of the chapter. We'll look at verses 23 and 24. Starting in verse 23. May God Himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and He will do it. Let's pray. Father, speak to your people. Your servants are listening. Give us what you have for us today. Amen. I think part of our problem is that once salvation takes place, we try to become this perfect specimen of a Christian. And we immediately, we try to obtain perfection because what we've done, we've set the bar high on ourselves because we've looked at other people who've been saved for 40, 50, 60 years and we're like, I want to be like that. Well, what you don't know about that person is they struggling too. <laughs> they got sin in their life. You just can't see it. <laughs> so we immediately, like, I got saved. We immediately think, now I got to be perfect. And then after we repeatedly fail at being perfect because you're going to repeatedly fail, what happens is you start to beat yourself up and eventually you will give up. That's why you see so many people. They come to this church. They reach this spiritual high. And then they crash and burn because they can't maintain that spiritual high. They've experienced worship. They've experienced the Word. They've given their life to Jesus. They got the free bath. And then they crash and burn because they can't maintain that standard that they've set on themselves. We try to reach this goal of sanctification before we ever really get started in our sanctification. And what happens is, is we try to skip the process. We're like, I don't want to go through the process of sanctification. I just want to be perfect. Well, I know your mama told you it's perfect, but you're not. In 1933, a professional bowler named Bill Knox bowled a perfect game. He bowled 12 strikes in a row, which is a perfect game of a 300 score. But he did something to demonstrate 
that you can bowl a perfect game without looking at the pins at the end of the lane. So he had a screen put up in front of the pins, just high enough for the ball to go under. So then what he did was he found the marks at the beginning of the lane. If you've ever bowled one time in your life, you know what I'm talking about. There's marks at the very beginning of the lane. And what he did, he picked a mark at the very beginning of the lane, and that was the mark he hit. And he did that to prove a point. He said, you're better when you aim at the mark that's closest to you. I think that the Apostle Paul is trying to teach us to focus on the right now where we're at in life, that mark where we're at right now in our life, and not something we haven't achieved. I think we need to hit that mark closest to us so that the process of sanctification then can begin to work itself out. But we all got some stuff that we need to work through and work out in our life. And if you say, no, nah, I'm good, you lying and you need to repent. Because you ain't good. We never reach full sanctification if you continue to try to skip the process. So many of us are trying to skip through a process that what happens is, is once we realize how much we really fell in life, we will eventually walk away from the church. Now, the definition of sanctification is this. The process of making something holy. Now, that word process is this. A series of actions or steps in order to achieve an end. You can't skip the process. In sanctification, you've got to take the proper steps in obtaining your sanctification before the Lord. And if you haven't figured it out yet, sanctification is a lot of work. Sanctification is a process. It is steps that you take. And you can't skip those steps and think that you can be all that Christ intended for you to be. Let me prove it to you. Let me prove to you right now that you are not who you think you are and you are not all that you think that Christ is intended for you to be. You ready? Go look at your social media feed. Your social media feed will prove how sanctified you really are or lack thereof of your sanctification. Your social media feed proves who you really are. We all got some work to do in our lives. And I would take it as far as the social media that the Holy Spirit said, don't post that. Y'all don't do that though, do you? See, I'd be wanting to blow some of y'all up and the Holy Spirit be like, don't do that, Logan. I want to make y'all look like fools sometimes and God's like, Logan, don't do that. See, I got to work on my sanctification too. Philippians 3.12, Paul said, not that I have already obtained all this. He's admitting, I'm not there. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Little victories are a part of the process. So when you hit a mark in your life, and, it may, and your mark might be, man, I just read the Bible for the first time. That's a mark. Celebrate that mark. Celebrate those little victories in your life. Man, I don't struggle with that sin anymore. Celebrate that. That is a mark that is part of the process. Now, you might see it as, man, that's just kind of insignificant. No, it's not. That is freaking huge. It is a big deal when you hit a mark in life. That's why the Boulder Bill Knox said, man, you got to hit those little marks first. And when you hit those little marks, you'll get the big mark down at the end. So you need to hit those little marks in life to achieve what it is that Christ has for you. That's why Paul told the Philippians, I ain't obtained it all yet. But I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to hit that mark close to me. And I'm going to try to hit that next mark. And I'm going to try to hit that next mark. And I'm going to try to hit that next mark. That's why Paul said, man, I just want to know Christ. Because I'm going to hit all these marks until I can get to Christ. 2 Peter 3.18 says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I told you this before, but I hate math. With everything inside of me, I hate math. Math, hatred for math runs deep. Like, I hate math so bad, it's a sin in my life. When I was in the third grade, we had that big math sheet that had to be done before recess. The teacher told us, every problem has to be answered. And if they're not answered, you're going to stay in here and answer it through recess. I wasn't missing recess because that was my favorite subject. <clears throat> Amen. So within a couple of moments, I had this huge math sheet completely done. Now, I got every single one of them wrong. So she sent it home. 
for my mother to go over with me. And my mother had to sign it and send it back to know that my mother went over with me. So that night, we sitting down at the kitchen table. My mother's already mad because she had to do homework, and that's where I get it from because I don't do homework. If these kids got homework, they do their homework. They didn't get the homework to me. They know I hate homework. Don't come to me with homework. So my mother sits down with me. She's fussing at me. She's complaining. She said, Logan, how did you get every one of these wrong? Well, my quick witty response was, well, nobody's perfect. <laughs> I had the benefit of going outside and getting my own switch. Sanctification does not require you to be perfect. If it did, none of us stands a chance. But it does require that you strive daily to be more like Christ. So I'm going to be more like Christ tomorrow. And then the next day, I'm going to try harder to be more like Christ. Sanctification is a lifelong process. And let's just admit it, some of us are better at it than others. And it's been said that, that you can't uh, the, the boat can't avoid the water that is that is in, but the boat can't avoid getting leaks in the boat. See, I think that's where some of us at. See, we're trying to live in something that we shouldn't be living in, and now we got leaks. Instead of insulating yourself with Christ, you, you see, it's up to us whether we become a leaking vessel or not. It's up to us to pursue righteousness. It's up to us to work out our salvation. 1 John 2, 6 says, Whoever claims to live in Him must walk as Jesus did. So how do we get there? Sanctification is a process that you must work at. But God is also working in and through us to get us there. Just, just let me explain. This is my definition of sanctification. It's an ongoing spiritual process by which God pulls us away from sin while at the same time pushing us to holiness. Amen. He's pulling us away from something, but then pushing us to something. And we have to be sure to understand that it is God who does this in us. We can't do it on our own. We can try on our own, and you can try all you want, but you will fail, and you will eventually fall away because you're going to start to feel like a failure. Look at the first part of verse 23 again. It said, May God Himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. It is God who does this. Look at what the verse said. Look what Paul said. God Himself does this. God does not delegate your sanctification to an angel, to a dead apostle. God does not delegate your sanctification to your pastor. God does it. God Himself personally oversees your sanctification process. You just have to be willing to become sanctified. God is the source. You can't do it on your own. Look, all, all we got to do is follow you around for about 10 minutes to realize that you, you, you ain't as highly favored and holy as you think you are. We just follow you around, and we're going to be like, is that person really saved? You ain't that good. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to His good purpose. So theologians have broken sanctification down into three phases, to which I think are scripturally correct. I'm going to give you these three phases real quick. The first one is this, positional sanctification. Positional sanctification. At the moment that you are saved, at the moment of salvation, our position before God immediately changes. We are no longer dead in our trespasses and sins, but we are made alive with Christ. And when we do that, God then secured our position before Him as His Son. Heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. Right then, the moment that you say, I trust Jesus as my Savior, positionally, you are sanctified. First John 3, 2 and 3 says, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what will be has yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like Him. For we shall see Him as He is. Everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself just as He is pure. So that's positional sanctification. 
The second phase is this. Progressive sanctification. As we grow, we gradually, but steadily, become more and more like Jesus. And I'm going to be honest with you, this is the nastiness of the grind right here. This is actually reading your Bible. This is getting in prayer with the Lord. This is fasting. This is embarking on spiritual disciplines in your life. This is the stuff we don't want to do. It's the nastiness of the grind. But in that, these are going to be the times where we're like, man, God's going to get us through those bad times in life because we have those spiritual disciplines. And see, the reason some of you are, are just so troubled by life is because you're not even trying to walk with the Lord. It's like you claiming to be saved, but nothing else about your life says that you are saved. Amen. And now you're wondering, why is it God not working in my life? It ain't that God ain't working. You ain't doing the work. I mean, when's the last time you got in your Bible? When's the last time you got that on your face and prayed before the Lord? When's the last time you asked God, God, make me holy? God, remove this sin from my life. See, some of you like your sin so much, you don't even pray about it no more. Philippians 1 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. And then there's final or complete sanctification. This is where your sanctification is brought into its fullness. This is when you are standing before God and he says, Well done, good and faithful servant. Romans 8, 29 and 30 says, For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. Those He predestined, He also called. Those He called, He also justified. Those He justified, He also glorified. Our union with Christ works us through the process, the steps of sanctification. God, Created us to save us. God saved us to walk with Him. God wants us to walk with Him so that we can become Christ-like. We become Christ-like so that we can be blameless on the day that we stand before Him. Look at the second part of verse 23. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're saved today, your whole being, everything about you will ultimately be sanctified. And I know right now you're like, man, I don't feel very sanctified. That's fine. We know. <laughs> but one day, your whole spirit, soul, and body, and when you stand before the Lord, you're going to be blameless and completely sanctified because the God of peace can make you that way. In verse 23, there is sanctification. But there is also preservation. He said, may the God of peace sanctify you completely or, or through and through. Then he says that you may be kept blameless. Now, let's just be honest. Anybody want to go before the Lord right now and be like, I'm blameless? That's what I thought. But he says that when you come before him, you will be blameless. That's the preservation part. God is able to keep you fully intact, free from danger, free from hell. And all you got to do is just get saved, man. When I was a kid, they taught us this song in children's church called, He's Still Working On Me. Y'all remember that song? Y'all remember saying that song when you were kids? Anyway, it says, He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and earth, and Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be. He's still working on me. That's such a simple song. But that is an encouraging song. As Christians, we go through these phases. We start thinking to ourselves, I'm not good enough. There is no way I can be Christ-like. I have too many flaws. And even though 
We're going to sin. Even though we, we got more sin in our life than we want to admit, we can still have God's peace knowing that we are a work in progress. You have peace knowing that God is not done with you. God takes all of your experiences, all of your failures, all of your victories, all the times you hit the mark, and He's going to use them to mold us. So don't sit there and think this morning that, Logan, I'm not good enough. Doggone it, nobody else in here is either. You just hit those small marks and let God just continue to mold you through the nastiness of your life. And some of you right now, some of you, I know how you're thinking. I, I know how you are. Some of you are thinking right now, that sounds good. But that's not realistic. If you meet, I oftentimes get sidetracked by life. There's so many times I question my sanctification. There's so many times I say to God, God, give me another job because I'm not good enough to stand in front of your people. And so many times I blow it in my life. I, I know how it is. These suckers here can ask. I done yelled at my kids. I done let 1, 4, 6, 8, 13, 15 cuss words fly. Then the spirit of cussing comes over me. So many times I let life just put pressure on me to where I take it out on the people I love. I'm a jerk to my wife. I'm a turd to my kids. And then I got to go waller in my own field, thinking to myself, why are you even a pastor? Like you are, you are pitiful. You, you are terrible, Logan. And then I'm reminded, I can't, I can't do it on my own anyway. I can't do this. I can't lead you because I know how I am. Look at verse 24. And because I know I can't do it, I got to do this verse right here. This is the verse I got to go to. The one who calls you is faithful. And he will do it. Amen. He's the one that's going to do it. Not me. Not you. You ain't good enough. We already proved that. You're going to mess up when you get in your car this afternoon. I want to share with you the famous poem written by Margaret Powers called Footprints in the Sand. I know I, many of you, you probably got this memorized and it's hanging on your wall at home, so just stick with me for those who don't know it. But listen to this. One night I dreamed a dream. As I was walking along the beach with the Lord, across the dark sky flashed scenes from my life. For each scene, I noticed two sets of footprints in the sand, one belonging to me and one to my Lord. After the last scene of my life flashed before me, I looked back at the footprints in the sand. I noticed that at many times along the path of my life, especially the very lowest and saddest times, there was only one set of footprints. This really troubled me. So I asked the Lord about it. Lord, you said once I decided to follow you, you'd walk with me all the way. But I noticed that during the saddest and most troublesome times in my life, there was only one set of footprints. I don't understand why, when I needed you the most, you would leave me. He whispered, my precious child, I love you and will never leave you, never ever, during your trials and testings. When you saw only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. One day, we are going to look back over our life and we're going to have to say, God was there the entire way. And for us to reach sanctification, for us to reach holiness and maintain it, it's going to take God carrying us. Philippians 1, 6 again, I already gave it to you once, but I'm giving it to you again because I like it so much. Being confident of this, that He who began a good work in you, or in me, will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. You can't do it, but He can. Yes. Have you ever went a couple months and not seen a child, and then when you see him, you're like, dang, what happened to you? You got big. You know what I'm talking about? And don't say, you look just like your daddy. <laughs> <laughs> that might be a bad compliment. <laughs> but 
But that's what sanctification looks like. You don't physically see it happening because you're in it every day. You don't see your personal child growing up, getting mature, and, and starting to have to shave and all that mess. You don't see that because you're, you're with them every single day. But let a kid go away for the summer, come back in the fall, you're like, dang! That's what sanctification is. Because you can't see it every day. All of a sudden, one day, you're going to wake up and you'll be like, how did I know that Bible verse? I didn't know I was that good at praying. I didn't know I was that close to the Lord. Lord, you got me through that, didn't you? Wow, thank you so much, Lord. And here's what's so great about it. Somebody else is going to come to you and say, dang, what happened to you? It's called sanctification. It's a process. Your sanctification, your holiness, is based on how close you are to the Lord. Amen. I want to invite you to come to Jesus. It will be the greatest thing that has ever happened to you. He will save you. He will sanctify you. He will satisfy you. And He will ultimately glorify you. Now that sounds like a pretty good deal. Look, we all going to have bad days. We all going to mess up. We are going to do things and say things. It's going to cause God to just shake his head at us. But it is God who is working in and through us to mold us into the image of Christ. So when you blow it, you ain't got to explain nothing to nobody. But what you do get to say is this. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. How loving and patient He must be. Because He's still working on me. Pray today that God will sanctify you through and through. Pray today that God will keep you blameless for the day of Christ. Pray today that your thoughts, your words, and your desires be for God's glory. Pray that God will make you more like Jesus Pray that with a clear conscience you can anticipate the return of Christ Jesus. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you. God, we love you. You're good to us. God, thank you for your patience. Oh, Lord, thank you for your patience. Thank you so much for your patience. And Lord, for my brothers and sisters here that are struggling in this area, they're they sitting there right now thinking, man, I, I done blew it. I done blew it bad. That's okay. Because what they don't know is the person sitting beside them blew it too. Just remind us that if we have confessed Christ as our Savior, if we are saved, we are covered by the blood of Jesus. And it is God Himself who is sanctifying us. Just let us get back in the grind of it. To get serious about getting in your word. Get serious about praying. Get serious about the spiritual disciplines that we know we need to be engaging in. We love you, God. Thank you. Let's stand up. Let's sing to the Lord one more time. Oh, Grace Church. Hey, listen. We've come to our time in the service where we offer up our tithes and our offerings. If you want to partner with us, you can do that a couple different ways. You can go online at gracebelleville.org slash give. You can do it that way. Or you can use our cash app down here at the bottom of the screen. But I want to show you a video of the progress of what your giving does when you partner with us of the new sanctuary. We are so excited. But I also want to read you something out of God's Word. So take a second, listen to this. This is really good. Proverbs 11.25 says, The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. That is such an encouraging word about how our tithing, how our giving and offering works. The Lord says He will refresh us. He will give back to us. So look, check this video out. We appreciate you guys. We love you. Thank you for partnering with us. We can't wait to worship with you in person.